nation are a proud and distinct people who have thrived for centuries across the many villages they occupied throughout their territory within what is now northwestern British Columbia. They are a people with a rich language, distinct customs and cultural practices that have sustained them since the beginning. Like all indigenous peoples across North America, major changes came to the Heisla with the steady arrival of the European settlers, changes that are still being faced to this day. One of the most significant areas of change challenging the Heisla is what is now known as the treaty-making process. But before we can understand the current challenges with the treaty negotiation process, it is vitally important to outline some of the key points in history that have brought things to where they are now. Let's start in 1850, when James Douglas, the governor of Vancouver Island, made 14 treaties with various First Nations on the island. In 1871, British Columbia joins the Confederation of Canada. It wasn't until 1899 that a treaty was signed that included a First Nations from mainland BC. This was an adhesion to Treaty No. 8, which covered most of northern Alberta. In 1915, an organization called the Allied Tribes of BC was formed to help give one strong voice to BC's First Nations. Shortly after that, the government passed a law making it illegal for First Nations to form such a group and from going to court over land claims. Pressure from international human rights advocates assisted the First Nations in forcing the government to remove the anti-potlatch and the anti-land claim sections from the Indian Act in 1951. In 1973, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled in the Calder case that Aboriginal title did in fact exist in BC. Following this case, the governments expressed their willingness to negotiate land claims. The Niska Nation enters into treaty negotiations soon afterwards. In 1982, the Canadian Constitution recognizes and entrenches Aboriginal rights. Aboriginal rights of title are not extinguished. They exist. Steve Wilson is the Chief Counselor and the Chief Negotiator for the Heisla Nation. He was elected in 2001. The testing for infringement is the Sparrow case, and that is still valid. And then the next thing that it, that it said is that our rights of title are not frozen in time, which is important because we evolved, and we've always evolved, and it, it's evolving into this century. While the Supreme Court of Canada, which is the highest law of the land, recognizes Aboriginal rights and title, they left it up to the parties to define what those rights and titles are through negotiations. This is exactly why and where the treaty process has become so important. And the law has come very far and very fast in, 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 in a global perspective. But in, in, in reality, what we're, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're breaking new ground and we're using legal principles to achieve those uh, goals and objectives that we set for ourselves. For every treaty, there are six stages that must be done before a treaty is completed. The statement of intent is stage one. And you present it and it's signed right away. For the Heisla Nation, it was the spring of 1978 that marked the first attempt to formally deal with the land and rights issues when a statement of intent was submitted to what was then called the Office of Native Claims. In 1983, a second statement of intent was submitted following a vote at a public meeting held by the then Chief Counselor Gerald Amos. In 1991, the BC Treaty Commission was created and the treaty process started and the Haiza were part of the original groups that actually filed their, their letter of intent. So then you move to stage two to show whether or not you're ready to enter into a treaty. In May of 1995, the BC Treaty Commission declares the Heisla ready to negotiate. In the third stage, the three parties negotiate a framework agreement. This is an agenda that sets out the topics, the process, and the timing for the negotiations. And then stage three. I don't think those ones took very long. Like they took from, um, 
When was it? 1993 to 1996? On May 3rd, 1996, a framework agreement was signed by then Chief Councillor Robert Robinson with the province and Canada. And uh, we are at stage four, which is the negotiation of uh, key land resource negotiations. Actually getting into stage four is where you're negotiating an agreement in principle. And we started our agreement and principal negotiations in 1996. So from 1996 until now, we've, we've been in those kind of negotiations where we're just defining the principles of an agreement in principle. Stage five, that's the negotiation of the final agreement. It's more details on land and resource allocation. The final stage is the final agreement negotiations and that's where you, you take all of the, the chapters and processes and you define to a very great extent what those things mean. And the treaty is broken down into components of governance, uh, fiscal relations, and then managing natural resources. And there's uh, a capital and there's the the other subjects that are that are not really defined but don't have categories so they put them into a general miscellaneous chapter when trying to understand treaties it's hard to ignore the fact that most of the rest of canada and first nations have signed a treaty this invariably leads to the question of what kind of example do they offer first nations who haven't signed a treaty those numbered treaties were, were signed an awful long time ago. And at the time we weren't, First Nations weren't allowed to have lawyers. And in my view, there were some good things about it, but there were some bad things about it too. Alan Donovan is a lawyer who has worked with the Heisla for close to 20 years on land claims and treaty negotiations. But the original treaties were not worked out at all. They were imposed on Aboriginal people who were provided with a written treaty and asked to place their X uh, by where their name was. Ken Hall is a hereditary chief, elder, and former elected council member who has worked on the modern treaties since they began well over 30 years ago. You know, when you have foreigners coming in and giving you orders what to do, I think anybody will get confused as to what they're talking about besides uh, our members at that particular time wasn't very well versed on English. And they didn't understand what those people were talking about. They were, they were, not only that, they weren't educated in their, in their uh, world, where they came from. And it's pretty hard for people to come up with a, a decision as to what the people they're talking to are talking about if they don't know what their intent is. Often they were told, and this is certainly true in the northeast of BC, that they wouldn't receive any rations in time of famine until they actually placed their X on the treaty. So those treaties, the old ones, are marred by coercion and the fundamental unfairness in the bargaining process. And there's the, the, the notion that our rights and title interests have been modified or extinguished beyond those treaty boundaries. And I don't think that's the case. I think that jurisprudence has now established that our rights and titles cannot be extinguished without our consent. And the Constitution says that anything that is inconsistent with the Constitution as the highest law of the land is of no effect. So in between those two extremes, the numbered treaties and the treaties that are that are in BC right now have to find the, um, a, a way to address those issues. And rather than have those implemented in our territory, what we're doing is we're saying our treaty negotiations should be based on case law. 